Funky Politics. Welcome back to the funkiest political show on the planet. That's right, y'all. The Funky Politics. I am the DC sitting here along with the Doc Ward. Dr. Ward, sir. How Funky Politics. Yes, sir. We put the rhythm in your blues. Mm-hmm. Let us be the one you choose. We guarantee you'll never lose. We keep you up so you won't snooze. I could do this all day. All day. But I'm going to stop. Don't don't don't, don't stop. stop. Don't stop. Nah, man. Cuz we got to talk about some real serious stuff. Ooh, everything is we gotta serious. We got to talk about God. serious stuff. You know what I, was, I I tell people all the time right what? now. And I know folks, it's strange. It's a new normal that's happening in our country and in our world. New normal. A new normal. I mean, the fact of um Normal. The local bars, are, they're no longer open for you to go and sit and socialize. No. The restaurant's no longer for you to sit and socialize and no. eat. Um, just even, in some cases, walking in your neighborhoods is not, right. is not allowed anymore now. Right. Uh, but, you know, I gotta, it takes some getting used to, man. I ain't used to this yet, man. I'm a social guy. I like to be out, kicking and having a drink, getting something to eat, hanging out with friends, you know, maybe the river if I'd like to, but I'm not a big river person anyway, but I'd like to be able to go down there and congregate with everybody. Shall we gather at the river? No, I don't. Hell no. <laughs> not at this point, unless you want to go wash yourself down in Jordan River. I ain't no, washing sir. myself at nothing in the river, especially the Mississippi River. Oh, Lord, not the Mississippi. Mm-mm. But it is a new normal. We're it doing is. things yeah. differently. We gather yeah. differently. We congregate differently. That's right. We worship differently. We, we socialize. socialize differently. Exactly. And, you know, it's just going to be one of those things we're going to have to figure out what we do and how we do it. Not how just long, differently, though? but better. How long will this take, Doc? I know you, I'm asking you to go into your crystal ball that you got tucked away in your closet somewhere, your secret closet. Tell the American people out there in the world how long will this last? Oh, don't man? worry about it. I can tell you. I'm going to tell you. Right. And everybody listen to me because I do know, that's one thing that I do know. I know how long it's going to last. How long? It's going to last. And listen up, y'all. This situation is going to last until it's over. Until it's over, it's gonna last until it's over, and I say that. What do you, you mean? Know, the event, the, the it's eternal gonna last. Over or it's just, going to last until oh this virus subsides to a point, and we know enough about it to a point to where we can treat it effectively, and it does not have as much of a serious health effect on those that contract it. Now, listen. I'm listening to you. I'm listening. And for all of you out there that are trying to put government leaders, and this is funky politics. Got to be. And. All you government leaders and other officials that are trying to put dates and times on this thing. My suggestion to you would be instead of trying to prescribe a calendric date to it, a calendar date. to Well, it, look at you, calendric. Well, you instead of trying to trying to put a date on it, why not put a situational end to it? We will be hmm. able to go back to normal once we find that less than two percent of the world population is affected by this virus to the point to where it is subsided to a point where we have a treatment in place and that less than 2% is affected. When that happens, that will be the barometer by which we gauge going back to work. Don't put a calendar date on it. Calendars were made by man. Sure they were, but that's how we operate, though. You, you're yeah, asking but, those of us who've been how, around. But that's not how coronavirus operates. Well, it man. operates irrespective of any of the that's institutions said, the new that we have put in place, including time. The new normal. So... Instead of trying to put this on a time factor so you can get back to your life, mm-hmm. get back to your life, which probably wasn't all that great to begin with. No, ho- ho, wait a minute. <laughs> the economic <laughs> stimulus now is on yeah, the way, and that's going to make my life once, better. But once again, that's all man-made stuff. Dollars, you know what? Coronavirus don't care nothing about no stimulus. Because even though you got $2 trillion, we really need probably will need $10 trillion by the time it's all said and done. Oh, don't say because, that now. because Because the – no, you got to look at it this way. What we're getting is based on the timetable that the officials and, and, and folks on Wall Street are saying that this virus would have an effect. They have no idea what all of this is going Kevin to Kevin McCarthy the other day said, this is the minority leader of the House, Republican, said out of California. He said that let's not talk about a fourth phase of a stimulus right now. Let's allow the first three phases to take effect and get the economy back on its on, on some kind of sound footing. I would say to Congressman McCarthy, sir, start planning the fourth stimulus. I'm kind of like you. Yeah. Two, if you think two trillion plus three billion, I think the first one, one billion and eight billion is going to handle half of this woe that we got right now, sir. 
3.3 million people filed unemployment uh, claims on a week ago. This Thursday, if another three to five million apply, we are not we're no longer in a recession. We're headed towards something that we've never seen that we have never seen in our economic uh, forecast in. Oh, God, since what? The fall of the stock market back in the early 1900s. Trust 1929, me. 1929. Yeah, you don't you don't want this. I don't think we're necessarily headed toward a depression uh, just because of what's going on now. But as I say oh, wow. all the time and in every episode and we'll continue to say we have to address the health aspects of what's going on first. It's the only way that we're going to be able to determine when people are going to get back to work in any scale, on any scale, any scale like what we've had before, so that we can start making the real predictions on what it's going to take to get the economy going. So so, so if you say that, if that's the premise, then why are businesses out there that are open that it apparently – I would say have no relevance at all to what I would consider to be essential. And this is just not in Memphis, Tennessee. It's all over the country. So there is an economic drive. We have to keep churning in this country. You can't cut off the supply chain because you cut off the supply chain. Guess what I you mean, got I'm now? not getting, that's not what no, I'm saying. No, you're, I'm talking not, about I'm the health, saying, you're talking about the health I'm benefits. I'm not saying, no, no. I understand I'm, that. I'm not saying stop looking at money, even though there have been some suggestions, at least for the markets, that we take time off and we take holidays from having to pay rent and having to pay expenses but what i am saying is that we have to do everything acknowledging the health aspect first chewing bubble gum and walking at the same time we got to do that because the people that are going to be mm-hmm. affected the most are those that are going oh. to need the most those that are the impoverished those that the live least in poverty. Divine. and we're going to talk about that a little bit more with our special guest coming back to you all david jordan and an expert on this matter of field coming from agape yeah, that's nonprofit right. organization that deals directly with that. We'll be and right. He'll back. be with us. What? Right here on Funky Politics. Right here on, he gonna be on Funky, Funky Politics. Politics, right? Politics oh, right after this, y'all stay tuned. The whole funk because we're so funk R&R on sports. Former NBA basketball player, brother Mario Eli. Welcome to R&R on sports. Pleasure to be on here with you guys, man. It's R and R on sports. Welcome back to Funky Politics, powered by the Kentucky Network. I am DC sitting here along with man, my long time, long time partner in crime. What did I say, partner in crime? I don't commit any crimes. <laughs> I don't do anything wrong. <laughs> Smoking like a true lawyer, so, no, but anyway, no, Doc no, Ward not, here not, sitting not with us. And on today's <laughs> program, we've got a, a, a wonderful gentleman who's joined us uh, to talk about some of the work that they do from a local perspective, but also looking at it also from a national scope. David Jordan, uh, the CEO of Agape Child and Family Services. Welcome to Funky Politics, David. Thank you. Good to be with you all today. Appreciate Good to it. have you here. Fantastic. Hey, let's talk a little bit about agape. Uh, share with our listeners what it is that agape does. I know the term, but uh, but can you share with those folks uh, exactly what your, your mission is? Oh, you bet. We are uh, agape. The word itself means love. Right. Yes. We're a, a faith-based, Christian-based organization. This is my 25th year as the CEO Ooh. of agape. And uh, for the last 10-plus uh, years, we've gone deep in communities uh, around poverty and poverty reduction. And so really trying to help come alongside of our families, very specifically in Frazier, Whitehaven, and Hickory Hill. And we're in apartments and surrounding area. Uh, we're driven by the voice of our families. Uh, we do it through what some people would call a two-generation model, serving both parents, both children. So it's a whole family, whole community focus. We've got 100-plus uh, partners and other groups, churches that, that we partner with, and we're really working hard to try to move the needle of poverty, measuring that. Um, one of the dirty little facts is only about 3 to 5% of our families living in poverty or dire poverty in our city and community, true in lots of other urban communities, only 3 to 5% ever escape out of poverty. Whoa. And so we're trying to move the needle by at least one percentage point a year, as little as that may seem, but one a year for the next 10 years. Uh, in the last three years, we've seen it move. Uh, the first year was by nearly 3%, second year by nearly 4%, last year 
this past year, 6.3%. While that's not nearly enough, uh, we're encouraged by some of the movement, but there are some huge systemic institutional and other matters that are barriers to our families. Uh, but with a lot of work and effort and focus, uh, advocacy, uh, churches in the center of that, uh, we're seeing movement. You know, David, I, I, I listened to your uh, to what you just said about the three to five percent of the di- people in dire poverty and how they I mean, th- those are some 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 man, that's some dire information. You know what I'm saying? How how would all of these major nonprofits, not only just around our city, but around the around the country that folk that are just really laser focused in on really trying to uplift did. Should we have started this maybe after the Johnson years when he tried to introduce the Great Society programs? Or, or is that a part part and parcel of some of the problems we're having right now, some of those types of programs? Yeah, I mean, the, the programs and a lot of nonprofits and there's a lot of giving that goes on in Memphis. You know, we're one of the, the number one, number two top giving communities. And sure. so there, there are a lot of there's a lot of good going on. With all that said, um, there are policies, there are practices um, there are institutional matters that are built, uh, frankly, to keep our families in poverty. And so, oh. as a simple example, uh, one of our, you know, if you have two or more children and you're in poverty, there is literally no way on your own to be able to get out of poverty, just the cost of child care alone. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so, so the system is built to, to, I mean, I use the word intentionally escape. I mean, you really have to escape out of poverty. And, and so, so there are significant systemic matters standing in the way of our families desiring, wanting, and even beat down trying to get out, even trying to find some sense of hope uh, around poverty and getting out. And so, um, so our work is very much on the ground. We're, we're with our families on the ground, connecting relationally, but we're also working at a, a much higher level, trying to connect with as many systems that are in play to help our families move and escape out of poverty. Okay, so let's just put a benchmark right there because what you just said in that last minute is is the essence and probably the most important thing we've probably even heard about poverty. It's not something that you can work your way out of, which is usually what you hear politicians and other people utter all the time. Poverty based on the system and the system of finances and people not being able to meet those financial uh, goals to even provide for themselves is in essence a concept from which one has to actually escape, not not work their way out of, but actually escape, meaning things have to be put in place for them to move away from it and, and, and get out. Yes, yes, that's right. So, so I mean, we, we've, we've got 400 years that connect to all of this. And so, so this, this is nothing new to all of us. And, uh, and, and so, so yeah, so, so we've got to frame it and see it right. Yes, there are, there are personal responsibilities and things all of us have to do, but my goodness, there is a system built to not let you out. And, and so, so we're working hard around the systemic matters as well as walking alongside our families on the ground in a very relational, personal way. So, so David, what what you just said uh, was something that we don't often hear yeah. from uh, white males or white females in our in our country, our community, and that is that the system is built to pervade this type of of, right. of, of poverty, right, Doc? Is that what I mean? That, I mean, you just laid it out there. That's and, what I heard. And, I, and let me say, it's got to be your your Christian based belief that that all God's children are we all alike, right? To be able to say that and stand on the word, and that's what I'm talking about right there. Exactly. So to hear you say that, man, I tell you, that's a relief to me because sometimes we have people in our in our society that want to blame you and I and some others for being impoverished because of something that we did or something that somebody did before us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We often want to make poverty about a moral uh, about morality. Yes. And yes, that you did something wrong. And, and yes, we all get stuff wrong, but we're talking about a system that is set up in this kind of way. Oh. And so, I mean, we look at redlining. We look, I mean, oh. we just go on and on in terms right. of all the system matters that have been set up and, and remain in place. It just the, the, the matter of poverty um, just it, it reshapes itself and shows itself in different ways in terms of the system approach. And so, so you've got to first call it out and you've got to say, okay, this is what the mm. problem is before you can ever really start dealing with a problem. 
And if you make it always about the people and you've done something wrong, then we continue to miss the real problem. Mm. So you take what you just said, what we've just discussed about about poverty and how it comes about. The concept of it is not something that you that you fall into necessarily by your own doing. And you overlay that with the crisis of coronavirus that we are uh, experiencing right now with the people that you serve and with those that are impoverished across the world. You know, how difficult does it become with this added issue for you folks like your constituents and I actually those who impoverished are the world's constituents. How difficult does it become for those who are the underserved to really find a way through during this time? It's a great question. And so what I think a time like the coronavirus, the COVID-19, what it does is it really illuminates the injustices and the systemic matters, even frankly, at a larger level. So take, for example, we're serving, we serve about, uh, we've served about 1,500 families in the last three years. We're actively engaged with over 500 families right now in Fraser, Whitehaven, Hickory Hill. As of this past Friday, 421 of those families are worried about and have concern, real concern, and even say, I don't have food on the table. Where's the food going to come from? Well, most people would say, yeah, I'm with you. I'm running the Kroger's. I'm trying to find meat. But no, 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 no. The, the, the matter is far larger than that. In our communities, we have people that don't have a grocery store within three miles of where they live. Exactly. Uh, and so you have the matter of food and injustices around food and available quality food for those living in poverty and impoverished communities that we don't see or hear about. And so we try to kind of throw that in as my own experience of, yeah, I need to get some more meat or I need some more chicken or I need some more bread. The issue is far deeper, far wider, and it just illuminates the matter. You have public school systems, and and, 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 and I understand Superintendent uh, Ray and, and all the other public school systems shutting down because we do have to honor social distancing. What it illuminates is that our kids are not only behind, generally speaking, in school and generally are going to schools that are the underperforming school in their community. Right. Now the divide, educational divide, widens because of the digital divide. And so we have 359 of our families that say of the 500 we're working with that we do not have either the, the needed device, computer device, and or connectivity to be able to engage in and receive meaningful educational support for our kids while they're out of school. So while not all, but the vast majority of our kids are behind educationally within a system that's not supporting them deeply well enough, and now the divide grows even deeper. Mm. So, I mean, those are just some of the the, uh, examples, I think, that the COVID-19 illuminates the great divide and, and puts a greater light on the injustices that our families are having to live in. So, so basically, the children become hungrier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they become uh, they, they're in a system now that even though they're home, if if mama and daddy is essential and they still have to go to work, then that child during the school hour is not being supervised. And you may have a nine year old taking care of a seven year old and a three year old. And this is fun. God help us. Yeah. God help us. But the other things that you've also talked about, too, is that if you have if you have children that have certain needs, if they're in uh, IEPs or have different educational plans because of their uh, based on their ability to learn and comprehend, they're not getting served in a matter that addresses those plans that they have, 504s and whatnot. But at all of this, before we've even talked about access to treatment for children and parents that may contract coronavirus. That's right. So before we even get to an issue of the virus itself, just the effects of it on the community in terms of social distancing, they are already behind in the most essential needs. Mm. Yeah, our communities wow. are already social distanced from our impoverished communities. Wow. And so so, so we, 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 that's been Absolutely. in play for a long time. Sure. And so again, I think what it just does is it puts the light on and eliminates even larger you know, these very matters of of injustices. That's exactly right. So organizations like Agape, understanding what we're going through and knowing that with, you know, poverty has been around before coronavirus, affects more people worldwide uh, and will affect more people worldwide probably even when coronavirus becomes controlled. 
But what are you, what's your organization, what are some solutions that you all are trying to work through that you're hoping are going to catch on, expand, that can help those who are underserved find their way and find their way to success? So conversations like this, I think it's important uh, to, to, to see this matter as a systemic matter. And in a, in a coronavirus, the COVID-19 is just giving light on it in a brighter way. There's very practical ways of folks saying, all right, I've got 421 families right now that say I'm hungry. Okay, I want to help support. So we have a mechanism uh, with food distributors and being able to use Uber and the Uber-like to be able to take and have uh, food delivered directly to the door of our mm-hmm. families. And so that's in place. And so, I mean, there's a cost. What we're projecting right now that that's $168,400 for us to be able to do that for a period of time for our families just around food. Um, for folks who are saying, how, so how can we help with this educational divide, this, this digital divide? Right. We've got 359 families saying we don't have everything that we need. Uh, and so we've quantified that is $125,650 is what just our families need. Now, there's things going on with uh, uh, Shelby County Schools and other school, school systems, which is great. And so we're trying to partner, and we are partnering with them around this digital divide. And we're saying, okay, with additional funding, we will ensure that devices get in the hands of our families. They'll have connectivity, and they'll be able to connect to educational resources. Um, And so those are just a couple of ways that folks can say, here's how I can help and how I can help right now for the individuals and families on the ground in terms of their immediate needs. David, David, David real, real quick, I, I'm glad you hit on that digital divide piece. One thing I, I, I think is important, there are cities in our country that, are, that have the 5G capability running through the entire right, city. Right, right, right. Why is it that the city of Memphis and other cities that are in underserved communities that have these compacts with, I I don't want to call the names of the companies, but they're out there. Why don't we have the same service that can run through those those zip codes that we know? I mean, we know that they're impoverished, at least through those with free Wi-Fi. Why can't we do that, David? Again, I think that the the opportunity in this moment is to be be able to see the problem, cry out about the problem loud enough, and say, "All right, we've got to solve these kind of things because they're solvable." Other cities have done it. You're exactly right. Mm. So uh, why are we not doing it? And a whole bunch probably underneath that. But yeah. here's an, here's now a moment to be able, for us to be able to try to step into that. Yes, sir. David, hey, look, we appreciate you stopping by to talk with us here on Funky Politics. Uh, the work that you're doing, uh, we consider that to be hard work. Not hard work, but hard work. Keep it up. Let me let me ask you this. Well, hard, is there a, hard, hard work is hard work. Exactly. Because it because there's there's no, you know, no, you don't get the same level of praise about it. So nobody's in a rush to do it, but it's definitely sincere. It's definitely needed. David, give me a website, because you all are a nonprofit, right? So I'm sure there are people out there listening that would love to sow a seed into, into what you all are doing. Uh, is there a website, an address, a phone number they can call? I know you probably all, I mean, you can't, you're essential. So I'm sure you all are not all pretty much, right? No, we're we're on. So, wow. so we've got 120 oh. staff, and oh, mercy. Uh, we're, we're we're at it and going at it harder than we ever have. So yeah, yeah, we're on. So so I appreciate it. Our website is Agape A G A P E means love, all one word. Agape means love dot org. Uh, you can call our office number at 901-323-3600. You can go on social media and find us, uh, Agape Means Love or Agape Child and Family Services in Memphis. Uh, Wednesday is our 50th anniversary, and, and so we'll be uh, launching and talking more and more about that. I appreciate this, this conversation to, to help raise that up. But uh, our 50th really is being used, and we're trying to use it for the sake of our families right now. So so thank you again. Hey, let me tell you something, David. We support Agape Family and Children's, and Children's Service. You all hang in there. And we'll get you back on this program real, real soon, okay? Thank you so much. All right, we'll be right back with more Funky Politics. The whole funk. I ain't scared of you, mother. Hey, I'm Williams Brack, co-host of Grind Set. The insight you gain from us and our guests will motivate you to take the leap into entrepreneurship. So stay with us. What's your grind set? And if you happen to miss some of our episodes, make sure to check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast provider. Grind set. 
on the Kazookian Network. We're back, we're back, we're back with Funky Politics, Who You With section. I need to talk to these folks. Who you with, Doc? Man, it doesn't matter if you're a millennial or if you are, I guess our producer is also a baby boomer or something like that. Oh, Lord. No, no. Baby yeah. boomer. They 75, ain't they? Something like that. Lord have mercy. But apparently something about this particular this Good. particular rendition appeals across the age ranges, man. Man, I get, on, I get down with this who you with. Parents and children can jam to the same thing. Who you with in 2020? I know what I ain't with. I ain't with this coronavirus. I ain't with that. Coronavirus is not on the ballot. No, it's not on the ballot. Technically, it's not on the ballot. <laughs> Technically, it's not but on the it's ballot. actually it is. It is the ballot, really. Was there something it's going to, to change the ballot? Was there something? It's going to, to change the ballot completely. It's going to change the balance. It's going to change the balance of the ballot. It's going to change how the ballots are distributed. It's going to be changed how they counted. Coronavirus has taken over. We got a new crown here in the world, and it's called coronavirus. Coron. Yep. Yeah, at least for the at least for this year. And you know the funny thing about it, the first time that we're actually talking about mail in balloting right. across the country. Yes. I mean across the country talking about mail because strongly it, suggested by presidential candidate, Democratic presidential candidate Joseph uh, Robinette. Joseph Biden. Yes. Wow. So what is Bernie Sanders saying about it? Jo- Bernie Sanders is saying he's going to debate in April. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying about but it. They've man. not said they're going to have you. Yes, what in the uh, hell yeah, is that? I, I, I don't about. know what the, I, I don't man, know and I'm not going to even discuss it. But he's, he's the reason why I said just as you said. Yeah. Mail in ballots. Yeah. What's going to happen with the Republican and the Democratic conventions in the fall where all the support is galvanized, where people get together and really, you know, really passionately and emotionally support and get behind a candidate. What's going to happen with the debates that are going to occur between the conventions? And the election. And then what's going to happen during the election? The entire culture of what we're doing and how we're doing it is subject to change, especially since now we know that what April 30th is our new deadline. Yes. And then given the predictions that were given to the president that yes. at least what one million people could die from this virus. Well, he, like he sent a hundred thousand. Excuse me, hundred thousand. United 100, States, a million being million infected, hundred thousand worldwide. Die. Yeah. Let me let me say this. Oh, but but wait a minute. If wait, there are a hundred thousand people that are dying in the United States. Given the rate of deaths to people that actually contract the virus, yeah. that means that the amount of people that would contract the virus would be in the what tens of millions. That's what he's saying. So when you Ten have a, when you have a disease that affects the tens of millions of people, that changes everything. It changes how you do everything. Changes the entire go- and it's thing. probably going to change who you with. Well, I'll tell you one thing about it. Uh, this president right here, I think, has solidified the fact that he believe he believes that if he runs a runs a clock out. Oh, we don't even have to have an election in November. Let me, but let me tell run you guys. Run the clock out. Tell me what you mean by run the clock run, out. Let me tell you this. Number one, the Constitution says that you will have a you will have a, an elected president on that will be sworn in on January twenty. This don't worry about it, folks. He got to go but anyway. But say who it is. Well, no, but but not, but he. <laughs> but, but we this but, but we elect the president. He will we not elect be the able to run the clock right. out. Is what I'm saying. Oh no, because he feels like well, I'm. This is for public. No, 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 sir. We're gonna have an election. We had an election during. But World when War you II, say run the clock World out, one, no, when I, you I, say run the clock out, do you mean he's gonna be able to somehow assume power on the basis of the fact that we got a virus and there'll be delays in voting, or are you saying run the clock out to the extent that people are going to rally behind? Oh him no, he's no, no, delays in voting. What do you mean? Delays oh, no, that's voting. not going to happen. Delays in voting. No, that's not going to happen. I think happen. he's going to no. cheer on the dear leader piece. No, that's not going to happen. No, we're going to have an election. We have to have an election. We're going to have to have an election. You know, that, yeah. that's, that's required. So all of you all out there who are afraid right now that you're going to get him for another four years regardless, that's not the truth. Hang in there. Well, wait a minute. Some people might actually support the president. Don't say you're afraid. I, I talked to three of them yesterday. Yeah, so there may be some people that actually support him. But but because for me, the president is the president. It's, a, it's an individual. My concern is that we will have an elective president process when we're supposed to have it and then we will have a president who was chosen from that process will be elect be elected and put in office on january 20th at 12 noon as the constitution provides that's my concern you- i want to make sure that we have a fair process leading up until then and i think that's what folks like stacy abrams is really really getting into right now with fair fight trying to encourage and and be that other voice in the room when state leaders get together and determine how they're going to go through the election process. I saw I saw a poll the other day that said that Elizabeth Warren, when she's on the ballot with uh, Joe Biden, there's a 52 percent chance that they will be elected with Kamala and with others 
uh, Klobuchar, there's only a 50% chance. Now, that tells me something right there. I'm really not a – I like Elizabeth Warren, but can she work within the confines of a of a Biden administration? I probably could. I, I, would, I He does solve one problem. He said, I'm going to have a woman on the ticket. Not a black woman. He said, I'm going to have a woman on the ticket. And so He didn't say black woman? No, he didn't say black because woman. Because people tend to believe no, that that no, meant no. black woman. No, no, no. He said, I'm going to have a woman on the ticket. And mm-hmm. so you got her. I mean, I think people could rally around Elizabeth Warren, a Warren, a Biden Warren ticket. I, I believe that. Honestly, I believe that. I wouldn't be opposed. I would, I would take her over Kamala. Okay. Well, I mean, Kamala, I'm, whatever you want to call to it. To me, I'm not really even into the tickets nah, per se. I am. I'm, into I'm more into right now making sure that there's a process that's going to actually exist. It's going to be fair. Well, because right now, even before there was coronavirus, there was concern about the integrity of the elections. There was concern about hacking into the elections. You know, I just received a call today from my son's school about how the lesson plans that are coming, the, the their whole computer system there has been hacked. So there's going to be a lot of wow. hacking going on as people are at home and, I tell you what's and, rely, not and rely more on computers. So I want to make sure, first of all, that there is a clear process that we have in every state to select the president and that that process has as much opportunity for the best of integrities to be integrated in it before we get into any particular running mate that he's going to have because I think he's got a lot of people to choose from I don't think it should be just restricted to those women who ran for president there are a lot of women leaders out here there's London Breed out there in San Francisco that's got a whole system of people that she's handling very well Mm -hmm. there's Keisha Lance Bottoms got a system she's handling well there's Lori Lightfoot who inherited garbage okay and she's handling it as best as she can. She's handling it well. That's Kristen Whitmer in Michigan who's handling the situation well despite the disparities and all the name calling she's getting from the president who's supposed to be leading this process. So I think it's a little bit too early to call one person mm-hmm. against the other. I think we should first of all be focusing on election integrity, the main things that affect Democrats and Republicans. You said about a process. And the making process sure that is those, in place. And making sure that those people in all states have access to the polls and that the polls have the right, well, I'm not say right information, but they are polls that we can say have the best of integrities about them. Well, this show, Funky Politics, has the best of integrity, but I sure will does. say this also, that there is a process in place, and it's called a primary. Yeah. And every state has a primary to to put forth their, pri- their, their delegates for the convention, right? So now with all of these states, all of the states knocking back or pushing forward those dates, right. those primary dates, let me ask you this. Does Joe have an does Does Joe have a message out there that's resonating right now? Because he's been very very quiet lately. Tell me what's happening with yeah. The, he has the, a message. He has a message. Okay, I'm a better leader than what you're looking at and witnessing right now. So you saying he yeah, didn't have to do anything? I mean, it's not. It doesn't have to be a policy thing because we're not really talking about policy right now. If this was a policy thing. based, if this was a policy based election, I guarantee you that somewhere along the line, Joe Biden would have been lost in the shuffle. This is an election that's based on restoration of our country mm-hmm. to into into place where it was before Donald Trump got elected. Donald Trump is the referendum. It's the reference. Excuse me. So the election is the referendum. He's on literally Trump. on the ballot. He's literally on the ballot <laughs> with more. coronavirus. They are twins. So on the ballot. So you're trying to say that the team is Donald Trump? Yeah, and I, and I say that. And, and I, I say, say it like and I say that. And I say that uh, without any you know disparity against him. I say that as neutral right. as I can say it. He's it's the referendum on Donald Trump. That's what this whole. That's the way the Democrats have posed this whole election. That's what they spent the last three years doing mm-hmm. with the impeachment and with indicting his uh, cabinet members and other people that were close to him. With everything that's come out right now about the way he's handling coronavirus, all of that is about putting him and his leadership and his integrity mm. on the ballot for America to decide do they want four more years of this type of leadership despite what the markets were doing before uh the crisis coronavirus crisis despite what may have what benefits may have come out of the tax cut do you want the same type of leadership from the same individual that's all they put forward one so it's question, not even about a one policy. question and we out of here yeah Election Hill tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow being a Tuesday. Tomorrow. Being a, being a Wednesday. Being a Thursday. Whatever, uh, uh, Sunday. Whatever the day is. Right. Who wins? Joe Biden wins, I say, by a very slim margin. Very slim margin. Because right now, with the way that everything has been categorized with, with Donald Trump and the way that he has just gone off on the governor of Michigan, a state he won before and that yeah. he needs. Yeah. He really needs. I don't know what the pathway to electoral college victory is with him if he loses Wisconsin, which he's losing, yeah. Ohio, which he's losing right now, Pennsylvania, which he's losing right now, and Michigan, which he's probably going to lose the way that he's acted toward Christian Whitmer. So just looking at the sheer numbers of it, it's a close election. No pathway to him for, 
from an electoral standpoint, like uh, he had with Hillary Clinton. Tell you what, we'll be right back with a little bit more of Funky Politics right here on the Kazuki Network. Riffin on Jazz. I'm Howard Robertson, one of your hosts for Riffin on Jazz. Riffin is your weekly visit with friends where we dive all in to that classic African American art form called jazz. So don't miss Riffin with me and my man Melvin Massey every week on your favorite broadcast and podcast platforms. Riffin on Jazz on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! What's real, what's right, what's funky, and what is always around? Funky politics, of course. Yes, sir. You and I. Powered by Kazuki Network. That's right. And, you know, we're under a pandemic right now, right? Yes. The pandemic that we define as the Nova, Nova Coronavirus. 19. Illness. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it definitely is a pandemic. Yes. But you know what spreads across 165 countries and according to the World Bank, affects more than 734 million people. Poverty. Mm. So if we can, that, that's the other pandemic. So if the president can call coronavirus a war, metaphorically, mm. we can call poverty a pandemic, actually. Because it also affects the large number, large numbers of people throughout the world. It's killed. It has killed large numbers of people mm. throughout the world. And it promises to kill even more people until we began to address, educate, and all work together to eradicate mm. this pandemic called poverty. And given the conditions that we're under right now with this illness, they serve to exacerbate and, il and illuminate poverty because it shows us just how the least of these are really the least of these. That's right. When we're walking around trying to find out if we have, you know, enough Clorox wipes on the shelf and hmm. toilet paper and paper towels, these are people that are just trying to find a way to get to the store. When hmm. we're trying to find out if we got chicken and meat and everything else on the shelves, hmm. these are folks that are just trying to find out if there is a way where they can even find a way to get some resources and then where in their neighborhood they're going to even have chicken or meat to be on the shelf. Those that live in food deserts when we're uh, squabbling over food choices and those that don't have a way to employment when we're mad because we have to stay at home from our place of employment mm. and those that don't have a place for their children to be properly educated when we're upset about having to be at home with our kids being educated my pastor that's said, poverty that's the face of poverty that's the thing that we have to work to eliminate my pastor said he said look some of us are worried about getting being able to to, to get the mortgage interest rate and all of that stuff mm -hmm. he said man there's folks out there that ain't got a mortgage they ain't got a place to stay absolutely what about the least of thine what about and is in the bible so the common people heard him glad what what about those folks out there those everyday people out there who are probably living in a car or living on the street yep right yep so yep. so and I know it looks difficult y'all looks hard right now I know it's not it's not great for any of us but guess what it's worse for someone else and we can go on and on about sure. that but I want to do this before we sign off shout out to David Jordan shout uh, out to David Jordan Agape. from Agape yes, for sir. showing us and, and, and showing us exactly what we're going through but the more important thing and the reason why we even brought this up is because those of us that think we're living in times that are hard and difficult for us Look over your shoulder mm. and you're going to find you're going to have somebody that's really impacted, not just by what's happening today, but they're carrying over the bad impacts from yesterday. Yeah. And if you've got something extra, and we know you all do, those of y'all who stockpile, mm. think well, about those. When you go to the store and you buy three hand sanitizers, think about giving one away to someone who needs who putting needs, it in a Ziploc bag? Putting it in a Ziploc bag. And if you see bag, somebody on the street living on the street, there you go. Give them hand sanitizer. There you go. Give them a roll of toilet. Why? Why can a pair of socks? Or anything. Human or if you don't dignity. want to go through that, organizations like Agape, sure, uh, and you got the information, are there for you to help you get to those who cannot do it for themselves. Because as the good book says, in as much as you have done this to one of these, the least of these thy brethren, you have done, done it unto me. unto me. Well, I don't preach. No, don't do it, Doc. I don't preach. Lord, don't do it now. I just Tune keep up. it real. We keep it right. And keep it funky and hope that some way along the way, you will hear this and do the same. But until next time, we tell you to do that. And wash them damn hands. And we'll see you next time on Funky Politics. We out. Funky.
Kentucky Politics. Recorded at Kentuckian Studios. Directed, produced, and distributed by Kentuckian. Thank <laughs> you.